Okay, so part part two of the podcast. So um, obviously in part one, we've seen you produce uh, a work of art, but um, you weren't always a florist, were you? No, I wasn't. I was a journalist until 2006, magazine journalist. Um, and then I saw a floristry course uh, at my local college. I was living in Peterborough at the time. Mm. And I just thought, oh, that would be fun to do. And I absolutely loved it. And... Um, so while I was still doing that course, I went to, um, there's a place called Oakham in Rutland. Yeah. And I went there and they had a sign in a really beautiful uh, florist shop there saying trainee, um, they were looking for a trainee. And I hadn't finished the course at the time, but I was kind of like, well, I don't know. So I went in and I said to her, you know, what kind of thing are you looking for? She said, well, as long as you've done the basics, which I had, um, we can teach you the rest. And I kind of thought, okay, that's good. And she said, would you like to come for an interview? <laughs> <laughs> oh wow okay and I kind of thought well we'll just have it as um you know a bit of experience of what a floristry interview might be like because I sort of had in my mind the view to maybe doing it you know going into floristry once I finished my course so I had the interview and she gave me the job Mm. so I packed up journalism and went back to the shop floor so were you ready for that were you ready for that change was journalism getting to the point where you were were you enjoying it and it just and floristry just came up or how, how did that come? It's a funny thing actually because looking back now that was 2006 so with you know 14 years hindsight I think I was suffering from sort of anxiety and possibly depression at the time that I didn't realize and I, I, I used to get so anxious about journalism and I used to worry about everything yeah. and at the time it almost felt like an escape it's kind of like right now I can go back to the bottom I don't have to prove myself yet because you know I'm um, I'm right at the bottom I'm learning again mm. so it kind of felt a bit like a release but that said I never never regretted it ever never at all um, and I suppose it's just a you know a different different mode of creativity really but one mm. which um, really appealed to me and I absolutely loved it um, in terms of kind of mentally I was think I was prepared for it but physically I wasn't Within the first six months, I went down two dress sizes from just being on my feet all the time, all the physical activity and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was, it was a tough old uh, apprenticeship. So then, so, uh, so that was a, up at Oakham, was it? So. Yeah, that's right. Ah, so then, okay. So then from, uh, from the way you're talking, that was a, that they were good mentors up there. They sort of took you under uh, their wing. Uh, she was a very good florist. She was a, she was a award-winning florist. Um, but not very nice to work for, uh, and I left after six months. Okay. And then after that, I had a series of sort of um, part-time jobs in and around Peterborough. It was a very complicated situation because my marriage broke up about six months after I went into floristry, and I found myself having to pay a mortgage and rent on a new flat and just doing anything that I could. So I, I was doing, at one point, I was doing two part-time jobs in two different towns in floristry. Um and then eventually I, um, I came to Cambridge and I thought, wow, this is amazing. I, I really want to live here. I, mm. I, I need to find a way to come and live here. And a job for a trainee manager in one of the floristry shops in, in Cambridge came up. I thought, oh, my God, I'd only been a florist for two years. I thought, oh, I don't know enough about this, but I don't care. I'm going to get this job. So mm. I went in and this was at the place called the Flower House on Magdalen Street, which is still yeah. there. Yeah. Um, I went in there and completely blanked it and they gave me the job too. <laughs> so from being a journalist, I went to uh, manager within the space of two years because uh, I suppose because I had a passion for it and I, you know, it was, it felt so much easier, so much more natural than the, um, than the journalism did. You know, looking back, I, I kind of thought I wasn't a very good journalist. Looking back, I think I was, but I just didn't have the confidence then. I, I was very insecure. Whereas yeah. now, you know, I, I never was in my floristry, never had any insecurities. I always knew I loved it. And I always thought, I hoped that I was, I was good at it. So, yeah. So then, so the manager side, so were you sort of managing people? Were you managing, uh, was it kind of a baptism of fire? You were doing the ordering, you were doing this, yes, you were doing it was it. Yeah. Yeah. Because when I um, took on the job, it was a trainee manager position. And the owner said, you know, I'm not planning to sell the shop in any point, not, not in the near future or something. And then a year later, she sold the shop. Okay. So she, I think she was trying to get me sort of up to speed so that she could sell it with the manager in place, which is what happened. So, yeah. yes, I was doing everything. I was ordering flowers. I was planning orders, ordering flowers, 
um, doing wedding consultations, making and, and planning and doing, and not just me, I, you know, there are other people there as well, making, planning, um, delivering wedding flowers, contract flowers, so things that kind of people would have in hotels or restaurants. We were making those uh, on a weekly basis for our clients. And then general shop work, people coming in for bouquets or arrangements. Um, we did quite a lot of flowers for the May balls when I was there. Wow. Quite big events and a lot of weddings at the colleges. So I, I don't think there's a Cambridge college that I haven't done a wedding at. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a great time. I learned so much in those few years. I was there until two, from 2008 till 2011. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned a lot. Yes, it was a baptism of fire. Um, there was one occasion I remember when I was, uh, I was delivering a wedding. And I think it was the first wedding where the, uh, the manager at the time, the owner, had gone on holiday and left me in charge on my own for the first time. Mm. And I had a wedding to deliver and I completely misjudged the amount of time that I would need. And I was just leaving the venue as all the guests were arriving, which should never happen. You know, we always usually deliver the flowers two hours before that, so that they're all set up, done, and we're gone before they arrive. So they should never see us on the day, yeah. apart from the, the bridal bouquets. I was coming out there dripping in sweat, you know, leaves in my hair, completely rushed off my feet because I completely misjudged it. So yeah, I after that I learned work out how much time it takes and then double it at least. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because, yeah, we've kind of all been there with, with <laughs> our own, own line of work. So, yeah. so, so, so you, obviously, you, the work for the company there, so you must have seen the, the sort of, um, the supply chain and the suppliers and where you get plants, but, I mean, it obviously shows in your bouquet today, uh, your bouquet, your floral display, sorry, um, that you are, you, you try as much as you, as you can is to forage, but also to buy it from um, organic growers, is that? Is that... Um, I suppose in a sense, I try and buy British flowers. Sorry, that was it, sorry, yeah, some, yeah. Yeah, British flowers, but yeah, I mean, when I buy from, there are one or two wholesalers that just stock British flowers, but they are commercial growers, so I don't think those are organic, but if I buy from small scale growers who, you know, uh, like artisan growers, if you like, they're pretty much, I would say, organic, yeah. Hmm. Uh, because, sorry, go on. I was going to say, and that's, you know, that's something that's really important to me, that when I started my business, I always wanted it to be British flowers as much as possible. It's still not, I don't know, actually, possibly it is now, but when I started out three years ago, it probably wasn't quite possible to do 100% mm. um, British flowers all year round. And the thing that you have to do is educate your customers that because they're choosing British, they are kind of cutting out quite a big range of flowers that they might otherwise be able to use all the exotics um and and those kind of things i mean it's not it's not completely true because there are growers obviously uh, there are perhaps more nurseries that grow these kind of things so there are um, orchid growers in the uk for example that yeah. you could use those flowers but they're more they more grow them as plants rather than cut flowers mm -hmm. so the the cut flower market in britain is much more domestic um native flowers or things that would grow in our climate really Mm. So it does limit what you can offer to people. But I, what I always say to my, my customers is, you know, if you give me the freedom to choose what I put in it, you know, that's seasonal, you will probably get a better result because I will put together things that you probably wouldn't have thought of. They'll have looked on Pinterest and Instagram <laughs> and said, I love this bouquet. And they're like, yeah, but that's got anthuriums in it. That's got proteas in it. Yeah. But first of all, they cost a fortune, proteas particularly. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be replicating what other florists are doing. I want to do something that stands out, that's unique, that's me. You know, I want people to come to Wild Rosamond because they want me to do their flowers. Mm. So when um, brides come in with that kind of thing, I say, yeah, that's fine. I can do it sort of within that scheme. But if you give me the freedom, I will produce a better result for you because I'm not being constrained by what you want because you've seen it in something else i can give you what you want but in my style and you came to me because you presumably you love what i did in the first place yeah i mean i i think that how can i put this so i think from a creative point of view i think i think there should be yeah I should, i'm gonna say i'll just say it i think there should be that the client should just allow you should allow the the the, the creative person sort of carte blanche because again um 
there's all what there is there's always that constraining of what you really want to do or there's a compromise in your kind of artistic values and it kind of the best results all that i find i mean i've seen this i've seen this you know with you know with many garden designers many different garden designers architects you know other creative professionals when a client just gives you carte blanche that always that always gives the best results yeah absolutely yeah. but you know you have to be quite sensitive particularly in my case and i suppose in yours as well because it's not the kind of thing that you'll buy on a regular basis people generally get married once and have the flowers once and a lot of people like to have an input in that creative process they like the idea of helping choose the flowers and things like that so it's it's quite a psychological balance in a way between telling them that you're the expert and that's why they've come to you so they've mm. come to you because they can't make or they don't have the time to make their flowers themselves um, but at, at the same time you don't want them to feel like you're telling them what to have um, you kind of are but in a nice way it's sort of leave me to it because I will do a great job for you if you leave me to it um, you know hopefully I'll do a great job if you if you have input but there's you know I've done weddings before where it's it's just a bit soulless because they've had so much input into what they want and, and things and it's not and perhaps it, you know that's my fault as well that I haven't given I haven't pushed them enough to say let me choose as well mm. um those ones they're just not as fun but the ones that I love is where almost it sounds a weird thing to say but the bridezillas the people that come in and they're picky and they're fussy about every little detail why because that means they're as passionate about passionate about it as I am nice that's what I like you know the brides that keep coming back shall we do this can we do this it's because it matters to them like mm. it matters to me Lovely. so give me that any day over someone that says what do I need to have I don't know what I like I don't know anything about flowers yeah um kind of hard <laughs> thing well I'll probably get a good job out of this because I'll do all the input but at the same time it's quite hard to drag people's ideas out of them if they're not really interested but that's nice as well you talk about bridezillas but when when you've got when you've got a client yeah <laughs> conversely when you've got a client that's kind of pushing you and you've got that kind of in your head you're going to think yeah they're going to notice that five percent that two percent detail i've got to get yeah. this right it's, it's quite yeah. nice actually for as a from a professional challenge as well i think so too and those those are the ones that are usually the you know the most happy with it because they've they've put the effort in it and you've delivered and they're like yes this is exactly what i wanted because i told you what i wanted mm. and then you deliver and they're you know they're over the moon about it nice so yeah. is that so is that so um sort of the the work that you undertake is is weddings is it corporates what what type of things do you get involved it's with? at the minute it's weddings and events um and i i have on my website that i do corporate flowers but i don't do any at the minute I have to say it's something that I need to push a little bit harder probably um mm. which would be you know regular weekly flowers or two weekly or whatever it was or plants that kind of thing so um but the one thing I don't do is gift flowers which um it was a conscious decision not to do that one because as soon as you start doing that you're buying a lot of perishable stock that if you don't sell comes off your bottom line mm. and because I did all that in the shop I saw what was wasted, what ended up in the bin because we couldn't sell it or, you know, because I over ordered or ordered the wrong thing. Um, so it made me think I, I don't want to do that kind of thing. So I, and also from a, um, a practical point of view, it's much easier. This is my spare room, uh, which I, you know, grandly call my studio, but it's a spare room. Mm. Um, well, I'm in my, I'm in my podcast studio, which is <laughs> obviously not uh, at the back. So it's in my, hence why I've got the background. It's just in my spare room. So yeah. A lot, of, exactly. a lot of spare room, um, uh, spare room entrepreneurs out there after the yeah, coronavirus. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've, all, we've all got brand names for it, the kitchen, <laughs> the studio, the whatever, but it's just a spare room. Um, yeah, so I didn't want to do that because I have done it. I know how to do it and I could do it. But for me, it was much more the creative challenge of doing something new every time for a wedding, you know, pleasing that, that bride or with events, events probably even more so than weddings, you often have just a colour palette or something, and then they let you go for it. Mm. Um, so that's what I love about it. Uh, what yeah. type of event, so, so um, in my ignorance, what, when you say events, what type of events do, do you kind of cut? Yeah. Uh, well, we're up in Cambridge, so obviously we've got the university, and they do a lot of sort of formal dinners there, um, okay, yeah. and that kind of thing. So those might be events. Or in fact, it probably is, it's generally kind of corporate parties of, of some description or um, there's the occasional private party that people might have um, flowers for, you know, if they've got a big party, an anniversary or something like that. Um, yeah. So 
in a way similar to weddings but on a different a different kind of vibe really it's it's something often you'll be dealing with uh, uh, you know someone from the um, events department who's used to doing events and used to just ordering the flowers like right we've ordered the flowers tick done and then they leave you to it mm. whereas with a wedding you get lots of emails backwards and forwards what do you think about this shall I do this how many buttonholes do I need blah 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 so events are easier in that sense but at the same time um, they're used to seeing flowers you have to impress every single time because you might do it more than once um, so I'm, I'm lucky that I've had uh, a regular event at St Catherine's College and they used me because they are trying to uh, make all of their suppliers much more eco-friendly so they're trying to buy local source local use British and when they found me um, uh, you know, they asked me to do the flowers for a couple of big events that they have every year. And they just, again, they just leave it to me, but they say it has to be all British and as mm. locally grown as possible, which is great because then I can, you know, I can show, right, this is how I can make British flowers look really good. And this is where things like the foraging comes in. Because I always say that um, with floristry, it's kind of like the flowers are the paints that an artist would have. And all flowers, all florists have the same ones. So you have like the roses, I don't know, carnations, whatever it is, the flowers that you can buy are all the same. It's the detail and the texture and the stuff in between that um, I think sets them apart. So it's me putting Scottish thistles in with, you know, these kind of flowers or with something really architectural. I don't know, that's what makes it me. That's what makes um, these paints combine to form mm. a Picasso or a Rembrandt. Yeah. It's how you put them together. And that's why I, I think of floristry as an art, because it's each person's individual style. Mm. When I worked in the flower house in Cambridge, I could tell just by looking at a bouquet, which one of my girls had made it, because yeah. they all had an individual style um, and all, and you know, the kind of co combinations that they would choose. They weren't always the same, but they were often similar, or they would often use the same kind of different accent, if you like. Um, and that was what was beautiful about it. We could produce really different, interesting bouquets you know, a regular customer could have four very different bouquets, depending on who'd made it for them on that particular occasion. Mm. I'm laughing because, again, you, you can instantly tell with garden design. You think, yeah, that's that designer. Yeah. That's that designer. There's that combination. There's that there's that ornamental grass against that, you know, daisy flower. It's, it's yeah. really interesting, actually. I suppose it's the same, isn't it? But it's, it's interesting that it should be so similar. Uh, yeah, well, that's that's another that's another discussion <laughs> altogether. But uh, yeah, so I do feel like again with 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 uh, florists and garden designers, yeah, they do have their particular style. Um, but that's again, that's just sort of, I say people's expression of of their own sort of personality, I guess. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I would say so. So, um, so where are you at now with um, with 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 the business? Because I assume. I assume the coronavirus perhaps has affected you or, or not? Absolutely. Or, yeah. I have no work at the minute. Um, up until October, all my weddings have been postponed. All my events have been postponed. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not working at the minute. I'm homeschooling my little seven-year-old, um, which is great. It's a nice break. But uh, yeah, there's. Uh, it's probably going to be a busy year next year because all the postponed events will be hopefully taking place next year along with next year's events as well so hopefully that's what's going to happen but um who knows you know it keeps extending extending um yeah but again it's but perhaps it's a perhaps it's a a sort of a a major well not major positive but positive homeschooling uh, homeschooling your boy and spending lots of time with him which perhaps you wouldn't have normally done um, yeah absolutely i don't i don't see it as a negative at all it's just you know i'm fortunate that my partner um, he's still got his job, so we're okay financially. Um, but I, I just see it as a break from it. You know, it's, I mean, I love my job. I love the creative side of it, but running a business, as you know, is, there's all the tedious stuff and the, all the social media that you have to do that I find quite draining at times. So to have had a, a break for <laughs> perhaps not quite as long as this, but to have had a break from all that is, is wonderful. And yeah, I'm loving it. But it's, but it's interesting, although but it, it can be a bit of a recharge because Mm. I mean, I, f I feel the same, you know, you can, I mean, I put three posts on Instagram today and I'm thinking, yeah, it's great, but it can be draining to keep it up. And it's good. I mean, it's good to, you know, it's good to keep 
you know keep out there and keep expressing what we do okay so um so okay so with the with the break bridget have you got any so again gives you the break gives you time to spend with your son homeschooling but let's just say looking into sort of 2000 and um 2021 what are your again what are your kind of hopes perhaps artistically perhaps professionally where do you where do, where, where do you want to be going in yeah well, I'd kind of like to be doing more of the same um, in the sense of more weddings, more events, that kind of thing. But I do also have um, a few kind of outside creative projects, as in within floristry, but outside of the sort of main scope of my business that I'd like to um, explore. And one of the things that sometimes happens in the wedding industry is people do styled photo shoots. So you'll get a lot of uh, wedding suppliers that of different types that all come together and a wedding photographer will take the photo. So it's, uh, you know, you've got models acting as the bride and groom or sometimes real couples. Um, and then, you know, you'll get a wedding dress supply, we'll dress them, a florist will give them the flowers and that kind of thing. And those are, those are amazing because they're where you can really show your floristry and do the kind of things that mm. you probably wouldn't get to do on a, um, on a real bride, but they're really good for your portfolio. So I'd love to do more styled shoots. Unfortunately, I had two or three that were canceled as a result of um, coronavirus. I'd love to do that kind of thing um, and I'd also like to do in the future some kind of sort of fine art floristry photography of some kind you know making this kind of thing making great big arrangements and have them photographed perhaps for sale or, or for I don't know calendars or greetings cards or something like that um, Interesting. yeah I have I have quite a few of those sorts of ideas that are uh, in my head I just need to kind of either have the time and or bravery and money to, to do them because there's a lot of me that thinks well you can't really be concentrating on that because you've got to make money therefore you need to concentrate on the weddings and then these things don't happen I'm sure you're the same you know you've got big <laughs> ideas for brand <laughs> that you like to design but yeah, yeah. when you design because you're busy running a business so, so to, but to that point then so these so this um this conversation will be going out on LinkedIn so is there any um is there anything that I mean, is there any kind of people that you would perhaps want to be linked to? I mean, you talk about you talk about um, you know doing these uh, you know these styled shoots. Is there a, is there types of people you want to get in touch with that can help? You know? um, I would say sort of photographers who want uh, a florist. It could be anything. It could be kind of uh, you know floral styling is hmm. what I would call it. I suppose where any any photograph that might want to have a floral element in it so it could be for example i don't know house builders that are uh, building new houses and they want to take photos of the of the rooms and would they want flowers in there to uh, as part of the the room set if you like yeah, yeah, or, yeah you know big elaborate events where they'll do some really fantastical sort of floral design those things would be amazing mm. um wedding planners event planners anybody like that anybody that's got even shop owners, I, I have visions of certain shops that could have a beautiful dried flower display of some kind that would mm. you know, fit with their branding, with their ethos, those kind of things I, I love to do. Big, I like big. <laughs> I don't do itty bitty small stuff. No, it, 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 it shows, doesn't it? It shows. Yeah. Like you say, a reflection of, reflection of your personality. You're not an introvert, <laughs> are you? No. no, definitely not. Definitely not. Cool, Bridget. Well, thank you very much uh, for uh, for doing the podcast today. It's been. Um, I knew it'd be. Bl I knew it'd be brilliant. Um, so, uh, so thank you I've very much. It. Oh, you're welcome. I've loved it. Thank you so much for for having me. Cool. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye.